All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this lecture at the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. Uh, we have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Um, our speaker today is Rebecca Koffler. She is an intelligence expert on Russian doctrine strategy and cyber operations. She's a former U.S. intelligence officer who specializes in open source intelligence an analysis of the Russian threat to U.S. and Western security. As a recognized IC expert on Russia, Rebecca delivered classified briefings to top U.S. military commanders and policy officials, NATO ministers, the directors of the CIA and DIA, senior congressional staff, and the White House National Security Council. As a bilingual analyst with a Russian native background, Rebecca has a deep understanding of the Russian strategic culture, mindset, and behavior. Ms. Koffler holds an MA in International Transactions from the George Mason University in Virginia, a BAMA in Foreign Languages from Moscow State Pedagogical University, and a Graduate Certificate in Intelligence from the Institute of World Politics in Washington, D.C. She is the founder of the Private Intelligence Consultancy, Doctrine and Strategy Consulting. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Thank you for this uh, kind introduction, um, Allie. Thank you for the, uh, to the Institute of World Politics for uh, doing this special work that the school does uh, in educating the cadre of uh, future officers within our national intelligence uh, community, national security, diplomatic community. Uh, thank you to past and present professors. Uh, Professor de Grafenry, Professor uh, Dave Thomas, uh, late Professor Brian Kelly, who is no longer with us, for um, helping me specifically, and uh, a whole range uh, of uh, intelligence officers uh, within the community to do the special work that um, needs to be done. Uh, before we start with the actual briefing, uh, I'd like to make a disclaimer that uh, the views expressed in this briefing uh, represent solely the views of Doctrine and Strategy Consulting and my personal views and not the views of any government agency or any other organization. Our uh, assessments are based on open source information including uh, unclassified and declassified data sources obtained through regular open source uh, research methods. Um, I'll give you an outline of uh, what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to start with uh, Russian worldview, um, Russian military threat, um, threat assessments, uh, President Putin's uh, strategic ambitions and goals. And then we'll talk about the role of um, Russian cyber doctrine in uh, Moscow's overall security strategy, foreign policy, and uh, military doctrine, because it's a key aspect uh, of those. We'll go down to uh, talk about the nuts and bolts of the actual doctrine, and uh, we'll close with uh, cyber operations against uh, U.S. critical infrastructure, and I'll provide the uh, bottom line assessment by Dr. Strategy Consultant. Um, now, without further ado, we'll start with the uh, Russian worldview. The reason we, uh, we begin with that is that we find that it is critical to understand your opponent's uh, mindset. Because that mindset drives the intentions, shapes the behavior. Um, the worldview is typically shaped by strategic culture. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because we covered that uh, during our previous briefing that uh, is available actually uh, on YouTube as well. But um, uh, uh, briefly, uh, basically, um, 
Russia has a unique sense of exceptionalism. It is um, a country um, that has a presupposition of conflict because it experienced um, multiple conflicts throughout its history. Uh, it has a worst case scenario um, uh, mindset and uh, also it views that the central power of the state is crucial to maintaining the security and the viability of the state. So in other words, the primacy of the state vis-a-vis -vis the individuals. So this type of the, the, the worst case scenario mindset is actually the baseline and that is uh, shapes the behavior and actually found way in um, an official uh, Russian military uh, threat assessments that are put out um, um, uh, regularly by various institutions, but uh, especially the uh, General Staff uh, Center for Military Political Research. Um, and uh, those threat assessments actually codify officially the United States and NATO as the primary threat to uh, Russian security. And so it places a requirement on the, um, on the Russian armed forces and the entire national security apparatus to uh, neutralize that threat. So we'll move on to uh, uh, President Putin's uh, strategic ambitions that are actually the, uh, the Russian government, the entire uh, government, the entire country's uh, strategic ambitions. Um, First and foremost, it is to restore Russia's great power status and ultimately to reconstitute the former Soviet Union. Um, the basic elements of it, not the geographic, um, um, they don't want the, the actual Soviet Union, but they would what they would like is to integrate the what they call the near broad into um, uh, what's called the Eurasian Union, or as recently as we've been referring to it, actually is, is the Union, uh, with uh, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan actually um, being the uh, official members. Um, to restore the great power status that Russia believes it deserves, and that it has uh, never been granted, uh, so to speak, by, uh, by the West, by um, the United States, the United States have actually uh, treated it uh, fairly and paid respect for all of the uh, achievements in the scientific uh, arena, cultural arena, etc. But most importantly, for um, for Russia's uh, contribution to winning the uh, World War II or what they call the Great Patriotic War. Um, so, and in terms of uh, reconstituting the, the overall um, uh, structure of influence, political and economic influence, again, it's not the geographic uh, borders that they're after, but they are maintaining the, the dominance in the sphere of influence of Eurasia. So, uh, why? Um, Russia believes that is a strategic imperative for them to maintain a strategic buffer because uh, traditionally that's the way that how it fought wars and invasions is by uh, relying on long distances uh, for the adversary to overcome before it reaches the heartland, the seat of the, uh, the uh, Russian government. So, so bottom line wants to be a top player in uh, in the world, it wants to be the dominant player in Eurasia, and uh, it sees the United States as the main barrier to those uh, ambitions, and therefore um, it has um, set a goal of defeating or at least neutralizing the United States. So it codified uh, us as a threat in a series of strategic. Uh, planning documents, including the military doctrine, and so it then developed a uh, strategy that is evolving, uh, evolving, and a doctrine that um, that is designed to defeat 
um, to defeat its uh, arch rival and the principal opponent, uh, which is the United States. That doctrine is um, uh, was approved by uh, President Putin uh, at the end of uh, 2014, I believe. There's a series of other documents, uh, specifically the national security strategy that uh, was approved by the Russian president um, in uh, 2015 that officially uh, placed the responsibility on the United States and NATO for the Ukrainian crisis for supporting the what they perceive as illegitimate overthrow of, of, of the Ukrainian regime. Um, it has also called out the United States on pursuing a uh, strategy of containment against Russia to contain you know, um, Russia's development, um, military, economic, um, etc. So um, the Russian government has decided uh, to develop their own strategy of containment. And President Putin actually approved in uh, July 2013 the uh, plan to, to, for strategic deterrence and conflict uh, prevention. Why are we talking about all this? The reason we're talking about all this is because cyber plays an instrumental role in Russian doctrine and strategy. Uh, before we proceed further, I'd like to make a disclaimer, and that is the Russians don't actually call cyber cyber. Um, the only uh, times that they refer to cyber as cyber, uh, kiber, uh, is when they refer to our uh, capabilities. Their official doctrinal term is information confrontation. Information confrontation, that is an official doctrinal term. What does it mean? Uh, information confrontation is a conflict that a country wages with its adversary in order to achieve informational, psychological, and ideological superiority. It is done also by conductive massive psychological influence over the population and the troops. And that concept is envisioned both for peacetime and for wartime. So why have the two, for, for just as a shorthand, we refer to it as cyber because it's shorter, but um, so, so, but they call it, again, information confrontation, and occasionally, they, not occasionally, actually, they use it all the time, uh, information weapon. In fact, uh, information weapon is something, uh, information warfare, in fact, that was the uh, mission of uh, Project Lachta, which is associated with the uh, um, the covert influence campaign designed to influence the 2016 election and the 2018 uh, U.S. election uh, midterms, presidential and midterms. Um, so again, Russia has a very different conception of of, of cyber um, from what the West has. Uh, it has two components. It has a technical component. It has a psychological component. And Russia emphasizes both of them. Um, in fact, uh, it often emphasizes the psychological component even, um, even more strongly. Um, um, uh, why is that? Um, they find that it's a lot easier to fight a conflict without firing a bullet. If you can, that's why they prioritize massive psychological influence over the population over uh, the country, um, domestic audience, external audience, what are we talking about here? So the key narratives, as is, um, is, you, know, you may be familiar, is the United States a threat, you know, it develops a whole um, uh, wide range of capabilities in order to uh, wage war with Russia, 
uh, specifically the uh, uh, precision guidance from global strike, ballistic missile defense. NATO is encroaching upon uh, Russia's territory with the intention of conducting regime change. That is something that Russia actually fears uh, intensely. Um, what other narratives, you know, what uh, we've seen in the uh, 2016 uh, COVID influence campaign is uh, promoting the uh, various divisive themes, anything that divides, you know, polarizes our societies, uh, anything from religious issues to LGBT to um, uh, racial issues, police brutality, uh, you name it, they weigh in. Uh, so that's the psychological aspect. They also believe that their information domain is actually off limits to anyone else. They have, uh, as I said, they have a unique conception of, um, of cyber or information um, security. Um, they believe that Russian information domain is their sovereign space. It's a unique conception of sovereignty. They believe it's the sovereignty not only extends to, you know, physical boundaries, it also extends to information boundaries and information domain. And they are really not happy with the fact that the West, they believe, continuously projects influence over Russian population. How? By promoting democracy. They believe that our democracy promotion uh, policy is actually a big threat to that because that can spark an, an unrest. They, they believe that we uh, use cyber which they call a political technology, in order to foment uh, unrest, you know, cause massive discontent, and create what they call color revolutions. There were serious uprisings in the former Soviet space, as you may know, um, and uh, also in the Arab world that they call the Arab Spring, and that uh, is the kind of phenomenon that, that, that they are concerned about. So, so they've chosen cyber um, as an instrument to achieve these various objectives, to prevail, uh, to first deter conflict with the, with the United States, but if that fails, to actually uh, prosecute conflict and win on terms at minimum acceptable to Russia, preferably uh, favorable on terms favorable to Russia. Uh, how do they do that? So, so again, there's a doctrine and strategy that the Russian uh, military theorists have termed asymmetric or uh, um, strategy of indirect action. Why is it asymmetric? Because they view it's the uh, weaker power trying to take on the stronger power, which they view also as a strong power. And, um, uh, and the strategy is designed to exploit vulnerabilities. What kind of vulnerabilities? Technical, um, societal, social, etc. Um, again, from the technical aspect of, of, of the cyber doctrine, you know, they are a full spectrum uh, cyber actor that um, actually, by um, in their unclassified remarks, uh, multiple uh, U.S. intelligence officials have acknowledged this highly capable uh, cyber actor uh, conducting a wide range of information operations, cyber operations, um, and, um, and uh, they're capable of uh, targeting practically any sector of the United States economy. They, they have touched those government systems, commercial systems, corporations, think tanks, um, uh, you name it. So, um, so highly capable. Um, and again, um, why, why have they chosen this instrument? It's a, very, it's a very unique instrument, and they are using it in a, in a unique way. In fact, um, the um, chief of Russian general staff, uh, General Gerasimov, uh, 
has articulated uh, his vision for a uh, new generation warfare by calling out cyber and special operations forces as the principal instruments of, uh, of warfare, uh, why it is bloodless, uh, it's uh, low cost compared to uh, <coughs> spending massive amounts of money on, uh, on weapon systems, although they obviously are doing it too. They're investing uh, heavily in uh, military modernization, but um, we're not here to talk about that because um, cyber is uh, is a preferred method, at least for now, at least for certain scenarios, um, because what they want to do is prosecute conflict below the threshold of military response. And cyber is an excellent choice for that. Um, um, again, low cost, bloodless. Uh, enables plausible deniability. Attribution is very, very complex, as any technical person would attest. Um, allows for surprise and fast escalation, which is important for Russian military doctrine. They believe that the um, party that achieves what they call strategic initiatives is better postured to win a conflict. So these views uh, have been codified in uh, Russian information security doctrine that was approved by President Putin in uh, December 2016, I believe. Uh, he also approved uh, at the same time that he approved the uh, strategic containment and conflict prevention plan is the information confrontation plan. And we assess that these are the principal documents that contain all of the precepts of, um, of, of, of Russian um, um, war fighting concepts that were designed specifically to take on a uh, conventionally superior uh, adversary. So, again, as I said, full spectrum cyber actor, highly advanced uh, cyber program. What kind of operations? There, there, there are four categories, about four categories of operations that, um, that we can bucketize them in, and that is uh, traditional intelligence collection, um, which is straightforward espionage, just like human. Um, strategic reconnaissance, and that's the information that is, you know, collected and stored for contingencies for long term, you know, whether it's a conflict or, or some, other, uh, some other objectives. Um, offensive operations and uh, integrated uh, operations, information operations that are integrated with uh, active uh, measures, which is unique uh, Russian intelligence tr tradecraft that is, uh, involves military and uh, non-military uh, measures to either influence uh, the opponent's decision-making process by distorting reality, by presenting uh, certain information, you know, again, something that we saw in, um, um, in various election interferences um, or in, um, in 2020. 13 um, situation has come to mind when President Putin uh, placed a, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times uh, putting pressure on President Obama uh, and the uh, American people to refrain from striking Syria in order to punish them for using chemical weapons. So in the end, you know, um, the U.S. stood down. President Obama did not. Not a result. As a result of this article, it's just an example of how information operations are integrated into a covert influence campaign. That's a lot more than that. Um, so those are the four categories. Um, it's very flexible. That's another reason that um, uh, cyber cyber that is uh, that they uh, favor it. How is it flexible? Uh, you can uh, achieve a wide range of um, effects. 
uh, from anything from embarrassing, you know, a person by hacking and leaking that personal information um, to discrediting the entire system. That's, you know, what we saw in the 2016 uh, covert influence campaign with the uh, hacking of the DNC and releasing uh, Mr. Podesta's um, uh, personal information, trying to discredit uh, Mrs. Clinton and the entire Democratic Party. Um, anything from that to um, connecting some intrusions into the weapon systems, rendering them inoperable. Uh, coincidentally, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a U.S. government report that um, uh, basically concluded that the entire U.S. weapons arsenal is vulnerable to cyber attacks. And uh, it called out on uh, Russia and China as the principal uh, threat actors who for years have been collecting sensitive information on U.S. weapon systems. So you can do that. You can actually um, create an ha environmentally hazardous situation, Russian military strat strategists posit, um, with catastrophic events, with events that are going to ruin the economy, the events that are going to set out a country backwards uh, in its development, you know, for for decades potentially, and and cost you know some human lives. So so it depends. It depends on what kind of effect you want to achieve. Cyber provides that flexibility because Russia wants to cover the entire conflict spectrum. As um, recent uh, unclassified intelligence assessment, U.S. intelligence assessment, uh, have uh, declared Russia is capable of conducting full spectrum warfare, nuclear, conventional, and what, what we call hybrid. Again, they don't, they don't use that term, but basically what the Western analysts refer to is the Gerasimov doctrine. Uh, that's the doctrine that was employed uh, during the takeover of Crimea and the uh, destabilization of Ukraine. Um, so cyber is able to achieve that. Um, uh, who are the principal actors? So, so basically I have already demonstrated to you that they have premium priority on this statecraft instrument uh, that is, uh, plays an important role in military domain. In, in, in fact, they designate information domain as the military domain. Um, so who are the main actors? There's an entire system, государственная um, система of информационного противоборства, state system of information confrontation. Who are the parts, who are the key pieces? Uh, the Russian president, obviously, who authorizes all major cyber operations, especially involving sensitive targets. Um, the Security Council, the key intelligence agency, the uh, FSB, the GRU, and the SVR. The uh, General Staff's uh, Sixth Brigade of the Eighth Directorate the um, General Staff Military Academy, which has an entire course training the future generation cadre of uh, Russian cyber warriors. Um, I mentioned the intelligence agencies and the hacktivists. They're not official part of the system, but as we have seen in the recent indictments for um, of, uh, of Russian GRU officers, of the uh, Internet Research Agency, and uh, most recently of the uh, chief uh, accountant of uh, Project Lockdown, which was sponsored by uh, Mr. Prigozhin. Uh, we have seen that, um, that they use, you know, they use uh, these, uh, these tactics very uh, in a very adapt, uh, adapt manner. Um, so they've been at it for a long time, actually. Uh, you know, at least for two decades. You know, if you look at um, Operation uh, Moonline, 
I just blanked out. 1999 operations. Uh, Moonlight. Maze. Thank you. Uh, Moonlight Maze. Early, early on, uh, took place. Uh, multiple military civilian targets were affected. Uh, but now we are actually moving to the crux of our presentation, and that is the cyber operations against the critical infrastructure, which is a big deal. This is not your psychological, you know, working the mind thing. This is serious business. This is a um, wartime applicable. Uh, Capability. On March fifteenth, uh, there was a uh, joint technical alert issued by FBI, DHS, and U.S. CERT. U.S. CERT is the um, our computer emergency uh, response team. Um, the alert warned uh, the American public that at least since twenty sixteen. Russia has conducted a multi-phase, sophisticated cyber intrusion campaign targeting U.S. critical infrastructure. Aviation, water, electrical grid, manufacturing, and other sectors, all the way to nuclear facilities. Again, sophisticated operation with quite advanced TTPs, technical and strategies, where they had a two-prong approach to, uh, to targeting. Uh, they had a staging targets, and they had their intended targets. The staging targets were typically um, websites where uh, professionals involved in that uh, specific area go for information, such as trade publications. Um, those served as the initial intrusion points, um, <coughs> placing the malware store, you know, having it being a repository of malware, and they pivoted uh, from those points to their uh, final intended targets. Um, the entire cyber kill chain uh, capability was demonstrated in that operation. According to U.S. government assessment, um, moved laterally, created uh, administrative accounts, took out information including blueprints that um, suggest that there's a long-term intent uh, to use that information for mapping out access um, future contingencies, uh, etc. Very alarming development, obviously. U.S. government is paying very close attention um, and has taken a series of measures to, um, to both telegraph to um, President Putin and his uh, military and political leadership, that that is not acceptable, that there will be consequences, because until recently, as um, you may remember during his unclassified remarks, uh, the former head of Cyber Command, um, Admiral Rogers, stated you know, when he was asked at one of the uh, committees, CISI or HIPSI, why is it that we see this very aggressive um, uh, posture from uh, from Russia and, and his response, well, well, because there are no consequences. Why would you not? Um, so that has, is changing. Um, and so why are they doing it? What's the, what's the intent of specifically of targeting U.S. critical infrastructure? It's a big deal, obviously. Um, the intent is typically the hardest thing um, to assess, as any intelligence officer will, uh, will acknowledge, including um, current CIA director Gina Haspel talked about how difficult it is to, to assess uh, intent. Um, we were fortunate enough, um, Doctrine Strategy Consulting uh, has come across information that allowed us to uh, uh, put some pieces of puzzle together, 
and uh, provide that assessed intent. Um, and that uh, is indirectly in response to uh, former DNI's uh, John Clapper, uh, who commented in, uh, again, in one of his uh, unclassified uh, statements to the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, categorizing or classifying uh, Russia as a uh, very aggressive actor. And the reason it's very aggressive is because of its intentions. And he actually uh, stated, I'll read to you uh, here, so that, that's quite significant. Um, highly advanced and aggressive cyber actor who will continue to target the United States, including our vital systems in order to collect intelligence, conduct influence operations to support military and political objectives to prepare the environment for future contingencies. What are the future contingencies? So this is what's called in the intelligence uh, business, the intelligence preparations of the battlefield. So our assessment uh, is the following. Um, as, as I said, the, the information, the, uh, the open source information that allowed us to, uh, to make that conclusion, that assessment, is um, Russia's acknowledgement of an existent, recent acknowledgement of an existence of something called strategic operation to defeat critical infrastructure of the adversary, or SOPCOP, as the uh, Russian abbreviation. So, uh, the information that revealed the existence of this operation, which is a war fighting concept. Um, spoke about the need for what the Russians call strategic non-nuclear deterrent capability. What does that mean? It can be a uh, conventional, you know, PGM type of capability that Russians are currently developing, but they feel that there's a gap, that they haven't closed that gap with the United States. So they feel that they can prosecute conflict at the nuclear realm, the nuclear threshold. They can do it without the between sort of what John Gerasimov said, uh, neither peace nor war in that gray zone. That's what the U.S. Army uh, classifies it as the gray zone, uh, where you operate below the threshold when. Um, you can't really name that operation as an act of war, right? So they can do that, but they can't cover that middle ground. So that's the context in which this operation was, uh, was mentioned. So the bottom line assessment is Doctrine and Strategy Consulting uh, assesses with medium confidence that Russian cyber operations against U.S. critical infrastructure seek to operationalize over the long term a wartime concept of operations and critical element of the Russian military doctrine called strategic operation to defeat critical infrastructure of the adversary. Russian military and political leadership views this war fighting concept as a contingency <coughs> option that can be employed in the run-up to an assessed major kinetic crisis below the threshold of a nuclear strike in order to deter, de-escalate, or win conflict with the United States on terms at minimum acceptable to Russia. So, there's a lot in there uh, to unpack, but um, I've covered pretty much all of the pieces in, in, as, as part of the briefing. So, if anything still you know, doesn't make sense, I can, I, I can ask this, but the key word, basically, it's a contingency. It's not something that you know, can be just used you know, today or tomorrow, because obviously that's the capability that will create catastrophic, you know, consequences. Obviously, neither country wants to uh, to start that. The World War Three, as uh, some people will uh, 
Quebec, neither side is really uh, is interested in that, so it's a contingency. Um, in the run-up to a kinetic conflict, and is intended as a deterrence measure, de-escalatory measure, and a, a, uh, a concept that would guarantee that victory in, in their view. So it might sound counterintuitive, a lot of Russian concepts are, such as the escalate to de-escalate nuclear concept that was uh, recently revealed in, uh, in uh, U.S. nuclear posture uh, review, the uh, 2018 document where the U.S. government acknowledged the existence of Russian concept and uh, our intention to uh, develop a counter concept to that. So that's the uh, assessment. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. you might be um, either conflating or slightly. Um, it was in several venues here. Uh, so he said it. I was not there, but a friend of mine was there. He said it in the Hudson Institute. He said it oh, okay, okay. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about uh, DNI uh, Dan Coates. You're talking about so, DNI. That's okay. That's okay. I got you. Uh, so in July, July 17th at the Hudson Institute. That's right. Um, Director uh, Coates, here's, here's what he said, you know, exactly. He, uh, he said that Russia is very aggressive in its cyber intrusion campaign and the system is blinking red. Basically, what he means is the indication of warnings. As, as, as we know, you know, as this school teaches, you know, us the primary uh, mission of intelligence is really to prevent strategic surprise, right? And, and to do that, we track, excuse me, indications of warnings, uh, signs. Uh, what indications of warnings? Well, there's multiple of them, you know, following doctrine and strategy is actually uh, the key piece because you can have a, uh, an advanced warning because the Russian doctrine and strategy has been in development for at least a decade and targeting the United States at least a decade. Um, that's what he was referring but but there are tactical also indications and warnings. And so he compared it to system blinking red before the uh, September 11th, and, and, and what he was referring to is actually that came on the heels of the revelation of the uh, critical infrastructure attacks. Again, as a, as a big deal. So, nothing happened so far. Okay, so he didn't mean to say that it's in, well, something did happen because that's what DHS, FBI, and uh, U.S. CERT have acknowledged. And it's actually happening every day. It's just the scale of it and the type of uh, intrusion. As I said, you can have a disruptive, completely disruptive or destructive effect, or you can simply have a degradation of the system. You, you know, you can to 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 basically sow you know confusion uh, to undermine the uh, the integrity of a database. You can you can you can do strategic messaging with it, uh, something like what we call shot across the bow, just simply demonstrating to the adversary, hey, we can touch you, we're here, we're in your system. You can start. We have administrative, you know, access. I can start, you know, answering help desk tickets, you know, or doing other or doing other things, um, rendering systems inoperable. Does that make sense? So, so something, something did happen, and something is actually happening every day. It's the strategic effect. It's the type of operation that is designed for wartime, 
that would occur in Russian view in the run-up to a conflict. That, thank goodness, did not happen. We didn't have blackouts, similar to what the Ukrainians did in December 2015. December 23rd, there was a, another very sophisticated uh, cyber operation uh, where three facilities within 30 minutes had a coordinated, very synchronized uh, cyber attacks causing, you know, blackout. In fact, Ukraine serves as kind of the testing ground, uh, proving ground uh, for Russia to test drive, operationalize its capability, um, um, do the battle damage assessment or the cyber equivalent of it and, and see the responses, you know, see how they have to respond. This is a, so, did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so, I uh, just wanted to clarify. So, were those the critical infrastructure attacks, were mm -hmm. those probes or were they actual attacks? And if we are saying to them that there are going to be consequences, what were those consequences and were they meaningful? So, uh, so attacks, again, is a, is, a, is a shorthand. These are cyber intrusions. The correct, the, the, the proper terminology to use I mean, uh, is cyber intrusion. Uh, but sort of lay people don't really understand what a cyber intrusion means vis-a-vis -vis cyber attack. Um, so pro, a lot of probing. In terms of our response, um, I don't track blue response because I'm a red force, red capability analyst. We, the intelligence community does not uh, track blue, but what I can tell you from sort of, again, um, unclassified information that is available to uh, anybody is that we have taken the situation seriously. There have been new authorities that were given by um, the new administration to Cyber Command. Cyber Command has actually um, according to that unclassified reporting, has initiated uh, first offensive operations against Russia specifically to secure the elections. Now, going down to the level of granularity that you might be looking for, I can't do, but, but steps have been taken in addition to steps that are taken in the non-cyber domain. You know, sanctions are designed, you know, to deter other things. Yes, ma'am. Um, with regard to the term critical infrastructure. Yes. Uh, that's kind of a broad term. Sure. Um, and I, I'm <coughs> asking to go down to, as you say, the granular level. Right. Uh, what, what would you uh, describe as some of the major descriptive categories of what would fall under the idea of sure. critical infrastructure. Uh, easy. Um, so DHS, I may not be able to name okay. all of them, no, but I'll give you a bunch, an and then I'll tell you how to look up the rest. Right. So uh, the Department of Homeland Security actually has designated uh, 16 sectors, um, and there was a PPD 21, Presidential Policy Directive, uh, co-defined that. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them are you know, the usual that you would think, nuclear, uh, chemical uh, facilities, uh, key manufacturing sectors, water, aviation, transportation. Um, Financial. Absolutely. Banking correct, correct, correct. Financial banking. Uh, but if you go on DHS's side, oh, we've recently added, you know, <coughs> election infrastructure. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but that's all available information, actually, Great. both to us and to the adversary, uh, sadly. Uh, Thank you. It gives them an idea to uh, find vulnerabilities. Yes, sir. With the, uh, with the Russian doctrine, and it's very clear that what they're doing is maintaining their primacy, or at least their, their ability to maintain parity at the nuclear level and run up to everything mm -hmm. they can do below the threshold of war. What happens if they screw up? The, the, the article that was in Wire magazine last year that talked about the three attacks in Ukraine, about using Ukraine mm -hmm. as the uh, training ground, was pretty, pretty enlightening. 
Right. So they create unintended effects. Well, that's what everybody's concerned about, actually. Several, it's not just in cyber, but we were very senior officials are concerned about the possibility of kinetic conflict due to miscalculation. Uh, we, our forces are operating in close proximity with the Russian forces in Syria. Uh, military exercises are conducted. The Russians just finished their largest military exercise. We just start, we just ended actually. Ours, we had, uh, uh, the Russians were flying their um, Su-27s buzzing, you know, our reconnaissance aircraft conducting two passes in very close proximity, um, activating afterburners, um, according to the Pentagon, placing um, U.S. military personnel in danger, you know, that's depends on who we ask, some of the Cold Warrior types who flew missions, you know, over Russia says that that's kind of standard procedure, you know, there was, there were rules of engagements that allow actually uh, both forces to, you know, demonstrate their power projection, you know, their um, skills, so, so that's done all the time. People are concerned about that. That's why people are concerned about that. that. That's why the current administration has taken very serious steps to establish some form of communication with Russia and low the tensions. Because, as we know from history, most wars start unintentionally, right? Uh, so, in terms of Ukraine, uh, Russia does not worry too much about Ukraine unintended consequences. Be, uh, at least. Definitely not at the same level that it cares about a NATO or a United States or a NATO country, you know. Um, so, but but it will, you know, something like that were to happen, unintentional. I, I mean, blackouts did happen, obviously, in Ukraine. If we are talking about something even more major than that, that's when they learn, you know, lessons learned and how to incorporate um, that into their. Uh, TTPs, but yes, you're absolutely correct. If you don't mind, that's not what I'm asking. Oh, I'm sorry. What I'm, what I'm, asking, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is it the Russians are in in our systems? We have, and the assumption has to be from a cybersecurity perspective that they are. If that is absolutely hundred percent correct. Yes, you have to assume that they're in there. If they are in there and they're doing right. information prep and battlefield reconnaissance, if you will, yes, and they screw up and they create an effect. Uh, for example, they black out Baltimore and Washington D.C. I'm not asking about our response. What do they do? Do they, do they all of a sudden come up and say, whoops, our bad? Or do they follow the North Korean model, you know, and admit nothing, deny everything, make wild counter So what just happened in Salisbury, England? Did they I don't know. I don't, I'm not come out? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm taking you into a different domain. Uh, former GRU officer and his daughter were poisoned with military grade uh, chemical agent and choke, right? Uh, the Russians, uh, once the two officers were identified who actually did it, Russia has put them, you know, on a TV show and had them speak and said they are civilians. Russia is a country that is a master of what we call strategic deception. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a state level uh, uh, a system of systematically uh, concealing what it's doing and also redirecting, confusing the opponent. So I'm sure there's a cover in place. So I don't believe that they would acknowledge that. And as you know, cyber, that's the one of the uh, beauties, if you will, a danger, you know, if you will, is that attribution is extremely complex. In fact, that same, those same remarks by General Gerasimov marvel at Cyber's ability to create a conflict between two different states. So, how do you know, you know, I think they can point a finger at someone else. Well, so far they're pointing fingers at non-state, you know, actors, or they just say, we don't do it. 
another way of uh, redirecting the issue that they like to do is mentioning Stuxnet. So the uh, the general staff's uh, deputy chief of the uh, main operations directorate, uh, Delevsky, just recently ranted about uh, at the um, at the uh, Russian um, annual security conference about Stuxnet and uh, basically talking about the um, sort of the legal framework that is basically not very well established in terms of what constitutes an act of war in cyber. There's no common understanding, right? Uh, at least not something that the Russians subscribe to. And they have their own interpretation of the international law. They don't adhere, you know, 100% to international law the way that we do. And how do we know this? What just happened in uh, Crimea? I mean, what just happened with the INF Treaty? So there's always an explanation, um, or cover story, or justification. In fact, they believe that their doctrine is defensive from their view. Yes, sir. Um, so I kind of want to go back to the uh, Ukraine battleground kind of scenario. Um, so the elections, the critical infrastructure, and then last year you have uh, the not Petya attack, uh, yes. the ransomware attack. Mm -hmm. So do you think that a uh, ransomware attack could have happened against the United States or um, exploit the vulnerabilities from our supply chain system? So not Petya was not a ransom, it was <laughs> posing as a ransom, uh, ransomware, but uh, it was, um, it was actually a yeah, disruptive attack that disrupted uh, several sectors, you know, media, financial sectors, uh, transportation, uh, in both uh, Europe and the United States. And as you know, there are a lot of unintended consequences, meaning once the virus gets out, it starts, you know, oh, including Russia, it actually eventually affected Russia. So. Uh, just like Stuxnet affected, you know, unintended targets. Did, did that answer your question? Um, or, my question is, yeah. do you foresee an attack like that happening against the United States? Or is it too is it too high of a threshold? Because the original attack was against Ukraine, and that spread out. Gotcha. So it depends. So it depends on, um, um, they do these things in response, typically, to something that we do. We unfortunately are not very good at reading, or we don't bother. You know, that's why I spend so much time trying to give you the full picture of the Russian mindset and threat perception. So, but we as a as a as a sort of national security apparatus, and I'm not the only one who says that, uh, and you can see that by things that you know happen. Sometimes we do one thing, but it creates unintended circumstances. So, so again, it depends. If all of a sudden they assessed that we are about to take over Crimea, heck yeah, that is a no-go zone, you know, for us. Um, does that make sense? So you can't really anticipate unless you you uh, look at the driving, the driving factors. And uh, the driving factors may be there because we had our own series of strategic planning documents that uh, the US government issued. We issued the national security strategy, we issued the military strategy, we issued the NPR, the nuclear posture. It's very clear to the Russians that the United States has declared interests in Eastern and Central Europe, and it has committed to advancing U.S. interests and values. So Russia views it as that we are on a trajectory to collide eventually. That is why, so, so in Russian mind, it's not a matter of if, it's when the conflict will arise and can escalate in the kinetic realm. And that is why they're spending so much effort in, in you know, 
brain power, effort, and uh, actual money on developing capabilities and operationalizing those capabilities. This is why we see these things happening because they want to be prepared. Yes, ma'am. What does the cyber infrastructure look like? I mean, are they using cyber criminals, shell companies? All of the above. Uh, so, as you know, the Internet Research uh, Agency is a uh, government-affiliated, um, independent. Uh, there's nothing really independent because the 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 government has the obil ability to mandate any company, pretty much, uh, to uh, especially in the time of war, to uh, um, to contribute to the mission of the state. So, but yes, to answer your question, Internet Research Agency, the GRU officers, as the, the whole structure, you know, GRU, SVR, FSB, you know, contribute uh, capability. The oversight is provided by the uh, Security Council and the Russian president, again, the general staff, uh, hackers, and even criminal elements are routinely employed as third parties. To um, to ensure that plausible deniability. So 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 if, if you uh, if you need specific information, the uh, the indictment, the recent uh, there was a series of indictments um, actually, uh, but the one that uh, was against uh, Ms. Kusyanova, uh, the chief accountant, um, that gives you a list of front companies. Uh, so, so there's front companies, and then I'm not sure if you're actually <laughs> asking whose servers they use. Uh, if they use companies, or is it state owned? Well, b both. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I was wondering, do the uh, Russians ever worry about uh, kind of spiraling um, self-fulfilling prophecy aspect that if they say ostensibly have, uh, and I believe it's certainly the case of their status quo power, that they are taking these measures to give them more of a deterrent as a defensive option. Mm -hmm. um, do they worry, I mean the U.S. national security and defense strategy up until 2016 didn't <coughs> designate Russia as a core opponent. Correct. And all of a sudden we redesignate them as a core opponent, something that mm -hmm. you know, hadn't been the case since the Cold War. That's mm -hmm. that means that the U.S. has made Russia less secure as a result of Russia's own aggressive actions. Because mm -hmm. We see their defensive actions as aggressive, so we move our military right. posture there. So, mm -hmm. are there any actions that that the Russians might be thinking of taking in order to uh, to demonstrate that their new found demonstrated mm -hmm. capabilities will be used only for defense? as a way to kind of de-escalate? I mean, you assume no. the Russians don't want... Because, because, remember, they view things differently. They view us as the aggressor. Uh, they view our actions to uh, invite Ukraine and Georgia in NATO um, as a precursor to eventually dismembering Russia. It's actually that drastic. There's actually a, a theory called Eurasianism that found its way into general staff. Mr. Dugin actually has done briefings, you know, for general staff. So, um, so no, because they view it as a necessity. They view it as an existential East-West type of battle. And, 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 and another belief, they believe that they can out-escalate us. They believe that we have the lower threshold for um, to tolerate casualties, to tolerate, you know, inconvenient way of life. Um, you know, the Russians have been suffering for most of their history, actually. It's only recently that they have got it, uh, that they have improved standard of living and, and only a segment of the society they are used to those. Yeah. Okay, can I follow up a second? Yes, I think you're absolutely right, and I think the Russians are actually pretty rational to view it that way. I mean, uh, you know, Georgia and, and Ukraine, 
right, are territory that very much would threaten their, uh, you know, their uh, strategic, their uh, you know, strategic depth and all of that. Right. Um, so, so like that would be certainly rational, and and they see the U.S. as aggressors, and we see them also as aggressors, right, and as trying to influence. So, uh, yes, is, is there any sort of possibility in Russian thinking for some sort of a grand bargain? You leave us alone in these four areas, and we'll leave you alone in uh, NATO, for example. Absolutely, <laughs> but the bargain that they would uh, accept would compromise U.S. values. So yes, they absolutely would like to be left alone to uh, uh, to have that dominance in their um, in their backyard. But not only that, they also want to be the top player in any conflict that arises in Syria. I mean, look, they want to be a top player basically providing, serving as the, um, as the chief arbiter of, uh, of peace. Except their conception of peace and their conception of the adversary and, and, and what is very different from, from the West. I, I mean, people whom they consider terrorists is very different from we consider terrorists. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, they would love to be left alone, but the problem with that is is that where where does that stop? And, and not only that, if if there wasn't that conflict with the United States, it would, it would dissolve their raison d'etre. Like it, it wouldn't allow them to shore up the power structures that they have. Yeah, that, that's kind of a, yeah, the United States is their resort, you know, resort that. Um, China is another um, great power that, uh, that Russia has serious concerns about. And China actually is not signatory to, to major uh, agreements, right? Uh, and Russia feels that it needs contingent capabilities. That's one of the reasons is it violated the INF. One of the reasons, there are other reasons. Uh, but um, because they feel that they need that ground launch cruise missile capabilities in the shorter ranges, you know, to prosecute conflict, you know, in Europe to prosecute conflict with China. Uh, yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about particular vulnerabilities in the Russian system to influence and information and psychological operations? And is that an area where we could be doing more? Sure. Uh, Russia feels extremely uh, vulnerable. Um, um, when you have an authoritarian, you know, society, Obviously, there are certain vulnerabilities. Democracy, with all the problems that we may have, there's actually certain robustness built in in the infra infragility. In fact, I think there's a book on that um, by a former uh, chief of uh, National Intelligence Council. Um, so, the popular dis why are they so afraid of regime change? It's because the population, there may come a point when the population is, you know, discontent, becomes discontent, because as we squeeze them with those sanctions, and that's what they are fearful of, is that at what point uh, the Russian people's belt can no longer be tightened uh, and in fact, um, they just had massive demonstrations. Uh, the pensioners actually uh, demonstrated, which is actually the most vocal um, uh, group, believe it or not, when Putin um, was trying to change the, um, the retirement age. And in fact, he made some concessions uh, on that. So despite the very high approval ratings that President Putin enjoys, um, you know, 80s, 90s, uh, which is unheard of for a democratic society. He, the, uh, the Russians feel that they need 
that level of approval in order to maintain that stability. <coughs> and uh, uh, because the, the, the country's history is just simply filled with regime changes. I mean, we may kind of laugh and think, oh, that's irrational. You know, what are you talking about when you talk regime change? But look at history, 1914, 1917, 1941, 1999, just in the last century alone, uh, they effectively had massive regime changes, right? Now, do we want to exploit those kinds of vulnerability? I'm not a personal, uh, I'm not a uh, policy person, I'm not a strategist. You know, uh, I'm an intel person. We don't recommend policy approaches. We only uh, foresee consequences or try to warn about consequences. <coughs> would Russia, it, you know, how would that react if we were trying to destabilize that situation? That is exactly what, what they fear. And um, so, it's a very, very complicated question and, and probably an in-depth discussion needs to happen in a different setting. Uh, but, uh, but it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Are you trying, is unstable Russia really uh, beneficial to our interests? Uh, the country that possesses nuclear weapons that sometimes can be not as secure according to some uh, analysts. Um, so what's in our best interest, a strong Russia or a weak Russia that can't maintain control of its tremendous uh, uh, capabilities, including nuclear, that's the, that's the conundrum. So I think I'm giving the hook. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you.